What is up everyone, my name is Joseph and welcome back to Casually Competitive MTG where it's our goal to bring you semi-competitive EDH gameplay content that's both fast-paced and entertaining. In today's video, before we get on to Season 2, we wanted to take the fan favorites from Season 1 and put them in a gameplay so you could see some of the commanders that you most wanted to see again. If you're watching this when it was uploaded, don't worry, we will still have our regular Friday upload. This is just a little extra video to have a nice send-off to Season 1, so don't worry, Season 2 is coming in just a few days. That being said, we have the opening hands in a few seconds, but let's go over some channel promotions. Firstly, if you do like what we do and want to help support us financially, we have a Patreon as well as a YouTube join button. We believe the reward systems are set up to be worth it for you if that's something you're interested in, and the proceeds directly go to help improve the channel quality overall. Secondly, if you're going to be buying cards in the near future, go ahead and check out our affiliate link in the description. If you click on that link or any of the deck lists in the description, any purchases you make in the near future will go to help out the channel at no cost to you. Lastly, if you want to talk to us or just be connected with us on social media, check out our Discord, our public Discord channel, and our Twitter as well to stay up to date. We have some announcements in the near future that we think you'll enjoy, including some hopefully possible conventions we're going to this year. Now with that out of the way, let's get into the opening hands and deck introductions. Going first, we have Joseph playing Ruikthar the Unbound. With this deck, the plan is simple. Play some creatures, ramp out fast, and just be aggressive through effects like Rurikthar's own ability to deal damage when people play non-creature spells, or a Cinder Vines, or just generic stacks pieces like a Trinisphere in order to slow the game down while assembling a combo like a Kikijiki Zealous Conscripts combo, or a Splinter Twin variant, or through a large finale of Devastation overrunning the board. Joseph's opening hand contained a Grove of the Burn Willows, a Chrome Mox, a Wild Growth, a Renin Six, a Reclamation Sage, a Natural Order, and a Tooth and Nail. Going next, we have Jordan playing Mr. Teller of Tales. Now, if you've watched our previous videos, you'll know I pronounced the name Hullen, and the reasoning is that on the CEDH primer for this deck, and through the research that I did based off of that, I do believe it should be pronounced Hullen with a, an inflection at the beginning that's not normal to English speakers. However, for the sake of clarity and understanding, I will say Chulane from now on, uh, because it does seem that's what most people are more familiar with. That being said, this deck looks to play out a lot of creatures, getting value off of the commander in order to draw cards, and assemble a combo with something like a Mana Breach or a Cloudstone Curio in order to constantly bounce a creature like Shrieking Drake, drawing your library and putting your lands into play. Jordan's opening hand contains six cards, and those cards are a Mana Confluence, a Command Tower, an Exotic Orchard, a Delay, a Mana Breach, an Avon Mind Sensor, and due to the London Mulligan, he put a Mirror Entity on the bottom of his library. Going third, we have Bill playing Neheb the Eternal. This mono red deck looks to ramp out fast not only with mana rocks and the likes, but also with Neheb's own ability in order to play large spells and just get value ahead of curve while assembling a Kikijiki combo or a combo with Aggravated Assault, which can be used with Neheb's ability in order to take an infinite amount of combat steps. Bill's opening hand contained two mountains, a strip mine, a rogue's passage, a simian spirit guide, a furnace of wrath, and due to the London Mulligan, he put a mountain to the bottom of his library. And finally, we have Nate playing Urza High Lord Artificer. The goal of this deck is to control and slow down the board through normal blue stuff like counter spells, but also things like Winter Orb, which Urza can use this ability to get around, all while drawing or tutoring up one of the many ways to make infinite mana, like Dramatic Isochron, in order to activate Urza as many times as needed to play every card in his library. Nate's opening hand contained six cards, and those cards were two islands, a Mistress Bobble, a Mystical Tutor, a Swan Song, a Cyclonic Rift, and due to the London Mulligan, he put a Trophy Mage to the bottom of his library. Now with the opening hands and the introductions out of the way, let's get into the gameplay. Joseph starts us off in turn number one by drawing, playing an Arid Mesa as his land for turn, and then paying one life to crack it to search up a stomping grounds, paying two life to have it enter untapped. He then casts a Chrome Mox, imprinting Tooth and Nail when it enters. He then taps the Chrome Mox for a green to cast a Wild Growth, enchanting the stomping ground. He then taps the stomping ground for a red, generating an extra green from the Wild Growth to cast a Renin Six. It resolves, and he then plus one's Renin Six in order to return the Aired Mesa to his hand. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan draws and plays a Mana Confluence as his land for turn, giving the turn to Bill. Bill draws and plays a Mountain as his first land for this game. He then, with nothing to do, gives the turn to Nate. Nate draws and plays an Island as his land for turn, and then for zero mana, casts a Mistra's Bauble. 
He immediately sacks it to look at the top card of Joseph's library and then passes the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and in his upkeep, Nate draws a card from the Mistress Bobble trigger. Joseph then draws and places Arid Mesa again as his land for turn. He pays one life to crack it to search up a mountain to the battlefield. Next, he activates Renin Six's plus one ability in order to return the Arid Mesa to his hand yet again. With nothing left to play, he passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws, and plays an Ancient Tomb as his land for turn, and then gives the turn over to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and plays a Mountain as his land for turn, and with no turn 2 plays, he goes to pass the turn to Nate. On Bill's end step, Nate taps for 1 blue mana to cast a Mystical Tutor. In response to this Mystical Tutor, Jordan taps all of his lands, taking 3 total damage, to flash out an Avon Mind Sensor. The Avon Mind Sensor resolves, and then the Mystical Tutor resolves, and Nate looks at the top four cards of his library and reveals a mental misstep, then shuffling his library and putting the misstep on top of his library. He then goes to his turn, untaps, draws, and plays an island as his land for turn, and then taps for one blue mana to cast a Witching Well. When it enters the battlefield, he scries two and decides to put both of them to the bottom of his library. With nothing left, he gives the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, draws, and plays a Grove of the Burn Willows as his land for turn. He then taps for 3 mana to cast a Reclamation Sage, and when it enters the battlefield, he targets the Witching Well. The Witching Well is destroyed, and Joseph then taps for 2 mana to cast a Sylvan Library. Sylvan Library resolves, and Joseph then activates Renin Six's plus 1 ability, not having any lands in his graveyard, but still adding a loyalty counter. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws, and plays a command tower as his land for turn. He then goes to combat and swings the Avon Mind Sensor at Renin 6. Joseph then declares no blockers, and Renin 6 take 2 damage. With nothing left, Jordan passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and plays a mountain as his land for turn. He then exiles Simeon's Spirit Guide from his hand to generate a red mana and uses this to help cast Neheb Dreadhorde Champion. Priorities get passed, however, Jordan, in response to Neheb, taps for 2 mana to cast a Delay. The Delay resolves, and Neheb gets suspended with 3 time counters on it. With nothing left, Bill passes the turn to Nate. Nate untaps, draws, and plays an Island as his land for turn, and wanting to hold up a little bit of mana, passes the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and draws two extra cards in his draw step due to Sylvan Library, taking four damage to keep one extra card. He then plays a Wooded Foothills as his land for turn, paying one life to crack it to look at the top four cards of his library for a forest or mountain. He fails to find and then shuffles his library. He then activates Renin 6, returning the Wooded Foothills to his hand. He then taps his mana to cast a Price of Glory. In response to this cast not wanting to have his instant speed interaction shut down, Nate taps for one blue mana to cast a Swan Song targeting the Price of Glory. The Swan Song resolves, and Joseph gets a 2-2 bird for his attempt. He then goes to combat and swings his Reclamation Sage at Bill, who declares no blockers, and then takes two damage. With nothing left, Joseph passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws, and plays an Exotic Orchard as his land for turn. He then taps for 5 mana to cast his commander, taking 3 total damage from his pain lands. With nothing left, he gives the turn over to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and plays another mountain as his land for turn, immediately passing the turn to Nate. Nate untaps, draws, and casts a Basalt Monolith for 3 mana. He then taps the Basalt Monolith and pays 2 life for the Phyrexian mana to cast a Phyrexian Metamorph. It resolves, and when it enters, it enters as a copy of Reclamation Sage, destroying Joseph's Sylvan Library. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, draws, and plays a forest as his land for turn. He then taps out completely to cast his commander, Ruikthar the Unbowed. Nobody has any responses to the big boy coming down, and Joseph then activates Renin Six's negative one ability to deal one damage to Nate's Reclamation Sage, killing it. With nothing left, Joseph passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws, and plays an island as his land for turn, and with nothing left, passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and plays a strip mine as his land for turn. He then taps his mana to cast a Rampaging Ferocidon. 
With nothing left, he gives the turn to Nate. Nate untaps, draws, and for one mana, casts a Mystic Remora. On cast, he takes six damage from Rurikthar, and there are no responses to Mystic Remora, so it resolves and enters the battlefield. With nothing left, Nate passes the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps, draws, and plays a Wooded Foothills as his land for turn, immediately paying one life to crack it to look at the top four cards of his library, finding a forest and putting it onto the battlefield. He then activates Renin 6 to return the Wooded Foothills to his hand. He then goes to combat and swings Rurikthar at Nate for 6 damage and the 2-2 bird at Bill for 2 damage. There are no blockers declared and they each take the damage. In his second main phase, he then pays 5 mana to cast a Possibility Storm, taking 6 damage from Rurikthar on the cast. He does not pay for Mystic or Mora, so Nate draws one, and then priorities get around for Possibility Storm. Nobody has any responses to the Possibility Storm, and this game is about to get very interesting. Joseph then goes to pass the turn to Jordan, and on Joseph's end step, Jordan taps for three mana to activate his commander's ability to bounce the Aven Mind Sensor to his hand, and then taps for more mana to recast this Aven Mind Sensor. Now let's take a second and actually read Possibility Storm because you may not be entirely familiar with how this works. Possibility Storm reads whenever a player casts a spell from his or her hand, that player exiles it and then exiles cards from the top of his or her library until he or she exiles a card that shares a card type with it. That player may cast that card without paying its mana cost and then he or she puts all cards exiled that way with Possibility Storm on the bottom of his or her library in a random order. This means that Jordan, due to his commander, will get two cast triggers off of each creature he casts. That is relevant, and I wanted to explain that up front. So first, Jordan draws a card and puts a tapped Temple Garden onto the battlefield from the Aven Mind Sensor cast, and then Aven Mind Sensor gets exiled through Possibility Storm, and Jordan starts flipping cards, exiling them until he hits a creature. The first creature he hits is a Priest of Titania. He decides to cast this without paying its mana cost, and then gets another card draw from his commander and puts an island onto the battlefield. When the Priest of Titania resolves and enters the battlefield, Jordan takes one damage from the Rampaging Ferocidon. With nothing left, Jordan passes priority on Joseph's end step and then moves to his own turn, untapping, drawing, and uh, let's say it's about to get very interesting. So like I said, every time he casts a creature, he gets two triggers off of his commander, so I'm going to try to explain this the best I can. Jordan starts off by playing a Plains as his land for turn, and then tapping for two mana to cast a Lotus Cobra. He draws a card and puts an island into play, and then exiles Lotus Cobra, and then exiles cards from his library till he exiles a creature. The first creature he hits is a Findhorn Elf. He decides to cast it, getting another card draw and putting a Plains onto the battlefield, and then the Findhorn Elf resolves and deals a damage to him from Rampaging Ferocidon. Jordan then uses his commander and pays 3 mana to activate it to bounce the Findhorn Elf, and then taps for a green mana to recast it, drawing a card, not putting a land onto the battlefield, and then Possibility Storm happens, the Findhorn Elf gets exiled, and he reveals until he hits a creature, which is an Elvish Mystic. He decides to cast it, draws a card, and does not put a land onto the battlefield. He then taps for 2 mana to cast a Lavinia Azorius' Renegade, which thankfully is not currently on the battlefield, getting a card draw and not having a land to put onto the battlefield, and then exiling Lavinia and continues to exile until he hits a White Mane Lion. He decides to cast it, drawing a card, and puts a Forest onto the battlefield from his commander. The Lion then, when it enters, bounces the Elvish Mystic to Jordan's hand. Jordan taps for one green mana to recast this Elvish Mystic, drawing a card and having no land to put onto the battlefield. He then exiles the Mystic and continues to exile cards until he hits a Village Bell Ringer. He casts the Village Bell Ringer and, on cast, draws a card and puts a Breeding Pool onto the battlefield, untapped, paying to life. When the Bell Ringer enters the battlefield, Jordan takes one damage from the Ferocidon, and then all of Jordan's creatures untap. Jordan then taps for one mana to cast a Land of War Elves from his hand, drawing a card and putting a Plains onto the battlefield from his commander, and then Possibility Storm happens, the Land of War Elves are exiled, and Jordan continues to exile until he hits a Shrieking Drake. He decides to cast this Drake, drawing a card, and not having a land to put onto the battlefield. 
It then resolves, and when it enters the battlefield, Jordan takes one damage from the rampaging Ferostodon, and then he decides to bounce the Shrieking Drake to his hand on its ETB. Then, he taps his Priest of Titania for two mana to cast a Noble Hierarch from his hand, drawing a card, not having a land to put onto the battlefield, and then exiling the Noble Hierarch until he hits a creature, which is an Eternal Witness. He decides to cast this Eternal Witness, drawing a card, and again, not having a land to put onto the battlefield, and as it enters the battlefield, takes one damage from Rampaging Ferostodon and puts a delay back into his hand from his graveyard. He then, for one green mana, casts an Arbor Elf, which draws him a card, and he has no land to put onto the battlefield, and then it gets exiled, and he continues to exile until he hits a Quirion Ranger. He decides to cast it, and draws a card, and again does not have a land to put onto the battlefield. He uses Quirion Ranger's ability to bounce a force to his hand and untap Priest of Titania. He then taps the Priest for 3 mana to activate his commander's ability to bounce the Village Bellringer to his hand. He then taps his mana to cast the Village Bellringer, getting a card draw and putting the forest onto the battlefield from his commander's ability, and then exiling the Village Bellringer and exiles the cards from the top of his library until he hits a Collector Oof. He decides to cast it, and then draws a card and puts a Glacial Fortress onto the battlefield. He then, for 3 mana, casts a Prowling Surfapod on cast, getting a card draw and putting a forest onto the battlefield through his commander, and then continues to exile cards until he hits a Wirewood Symbiote. He decides to cast it, and on cast, draws a card and puts a Strip Mine onto the battlefield, taking a damage from Rampaging Ferostodon when the creature enters the battlefield. He then decides to activate Wirewood by bouncing Quirion Ranger to his hand to untap Priest of Titania. He then casts the Quirion Ranger for 1 green mana, draws a card, has no land to put onto the battlefield, and then continues to exile cards until he hits his first creature, which is a Kataki War Mage. He decides to cast it, obviously, and draws a card, has no lands to put onto the battlefield, and then, like he has been doing each of these times, shuffles the exiled cards and puts them to the bottom of his library. When it enters the battlefield, Jordan takes yet another damage from Rampaging Ferostodon. He then looks at his board state, and looks at his hands, and with a heavy heart, decides to pass the turn to Bill, discarding to hand size. Everyone, surprised that it got this far, breathes a sigh of relief, and Bill then untaps and in his upkeep removes the last time counter on his Neheb Dreadhorde Champion that was put there from delay, and decides to cast this for free. Now, since it wasn't cast from his hand, he is able to actually cast the spell that he wants to. It resolves, and it enters with haste. He takes a damage from Rampaging Ferocidon, and then draws his card for turn. He then taps out completely to cast his commander, Neheb the Eternal. It resolves, and when it enters, Rampaging Ferocidon deals 1 damage to Bill. He then goes to combat and swings Neheb, Dreadhorde Champion, and the Ferocidon at Nate for 8 total damage. Nate declares no blockers, the damage goes through, and Neheb triggers, and Bill decides to discard 3 cards, getting 3 red mana, and then drawing 3 cards. He then goes to his second main phase, and due to the 8 combat damage that was dealt, he adds 8 more red mana to his mana pool from Neheb the Eternal. He uses some of that mana to cast a combat celebrant. It's cast, and then immediately exiled, and he then exiles cards until he hits a treasure nabber. He decides to cast it, and when it enters, deals 1 total damage to him from Rampaging Ferocidon. He then uses more of this floating mana to cast a Vandal Blast, targeting the Basalt Monolith and paying for the Mystic Remora. He takes 6 total damage from Rurik Thar, and then exiles Vandal Blast, and continues to flip until he hits another sorcery. The first sorcery he hits is a Ruination. He decides to cast this Ruination, taking 6 more damage from Rurik Thar, and then priorities go around. In response to the Ruination, knowing he needs to maintain as much mana as possible, Jordan pays a green mana to cast Noxious Revival from his hand. He takes 6 damage from Rurik Thar and does not pay for Mystic Remora, so Nate draws a card. He then exiles Noxious Revival and continues to exile cards until he hits the first instant, which is a Flusterstorm. He decides to cast the Flusterstorm, targeting the Ruination, 
taking six more damage from Rook Thar, and then no one has any responses to Flusterstorm, and the Ruined Nation is countered. With nothing left, Bill decides to give the turn over to Nate. Nate untaps and in his upkeep does not pay for the Kataki trigger and lets his Basalt Monolith die. He does, however, pay for his Mystic Remora. He then draws a card and decides to give the turn to Joseph. Joseph untaps and in his upkeep does not pay for Chrome Mox from the Kataki trigger and lets it die as well. He then draws and plays a Mountain as his land for turn. He then taps for 3 mana to cast an Eternal Witness. Eternal Witness gets exiled and Joseph starts exiling cards until he hits a creature, and the first creature he hits is an Imperial Recruiter. He decides to cast it, getting 1 damage dealt to him from the Rampaging Ferocidon when it enters, and then he tutors up an Arbor Elf to his hand. He then taps his Enchanted Land to generate 2 green mana to cast this Arbor Elf. It gets exiled and then he continues to exile cards until he hits a Dockside Extortionist. He decides to cast it, and when it enters the battlefield, Rampaging Ferocidon deals 1 damage to Joseph, and Dockside then creates 1 treasure. Joseph then moves to combat and swings his Rexage and Bird at Jordan, and Ruik Thar at Bill. Jordan declares his Eternal Witness as a blocker for the Reclamation Sage. Bill, wanting to save his creatures, declares no blockers, and then the damage goes through. Jordan takes two in the air, and Bill takes six commander damage. In his second main phase, Joseph activates the negative one ability of Renin Six to ping Jordan for one damage. With nothing left, Joseph passes the turn to Jordan. Jordan untaps, draws, and being at 2 life with really not much else to do, decides to just go for broke. He taps for 1 mana to cast a Shrieking Drake, drawing a card and putting in a Dark R Waste onto the battlefield from his commander's ability, and then exiles cards until he hits a creature. Now he needs to hit basically one creature here, and that creature is a Mirror Entity. So would allow him to pump up his creatures and hopefully swing to at least take away some of the problem people at the board. So that's what he's going for. So he continues to exile until he hits a creature, and the first creature he hits is a Faebro Elder. He decides to cast it, drawing a card and not putting a land onto the battlefield, and then when it enters, Rampaging Ferocidon deals 1 damage to Jordan. With nothing left, Jordan passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps, draws, and immediately goes to combat. He declares both of his Nehebs at Nate's for a total of 9 damage. In response, Nate casts Cyclonic Rift from his hand, targeting the Possibility Storm. Rukthar deals 6 damage to Nate on cast, and he then starts flipping for the first instant. Now in case you're wondering why he did this, he's looking for Evacuation to save him from this 9 damage that's coming through. So he flips until he hits an instant spell, and the first one he hits is a Chain of Vapor. He decides to not cast this, and then shuffles all of his exiled cards into the bottom of his library. He then proceeds to combat damage, and Nate takes 9 damage from both Nehebs. On combat damage, Neheb Dreadhorde Champion triggers, and in response to this trigger, Jordan sacrifices his Strip Mine to destroy one of Bill's mountains. It resolves, and then Bill decides to discard 3 cards, to draw 3 cards, and add 3 red mana to his mana pool. He then goes to a second main phase and adds 9 more red mana to his mana pool from Neheb the Eternal. However, there's nothing he can really do with this mana at this time and has to just give the turn to Nate. Nate untaps and in his upkeep does not pay for Amora, letting it go to his graveyard. He then draws and knows that no matter what, he's just dead in the next turn cycle, so decides to go out on his own terms and taps for 2 mana to cast a Winter Orb. On cast, Ruikthar deals 6 damage to Nate, killing him. The phases pass through Nate's turn, and Joseph then goes to his turn. Joseph untaps, and in his upkeep does not pay for his treasure token and has to sacrifice it. We unfortunately forget to remove it from the battlefield for a turn or two, but it never gets used and does not affect the game. Joseph then draws, and immediately activates Ren and Six's negative 1 ability to deal the final damage to Jordan. In response, following Nate's example, Jordan decides to go out on his own terms. He pays 3 mana to activate his commander to bounce White Mane Lion to his hand, and then taps for 2 mana to flash out White Mane Lion. On cast, he draws a card and does not put a land onto the battlefield. He then exiles cards from the top of his library until he hits the first creature, which is a Trophy Mage. He decides to cast it, and on cast, he draws a card and puts a Forbidden Orchard onto the battlefield. 
It then resolves, and in response to the rampaging Ferocidon's ETB trigger, Jordan pays one life to tap his mana Confluence, taking himself out of the game. Joseph then plays a Wooded Foothills as his land for turn. He then goes to combat, swinging the Bird and Rurikthar at Bill, who declares no blockers and takes a damage. At this point, the table kind of agrees that the game is pretty much over at this point, and Bill decides to concede the game, just to save time. All in all, Bill could have held on for a few more turns, but there's no way he could outpace Joseph who had 22 life at this point, and especially since Joseph could replay Ruikthar if it got double blocked on this turn, and Bill also knew that Joseph had an Arid Mesa in hand because he had been replaying it all game, so there's really no way for him to bounce back from this, especially with the possibility storm, meaning that even if he had creatures in his hand at this point, they'd be unreliable and would also do damage to him with Rampaging Ferocidon, so there's really no Nothing that he could have done to bounce back in this game, so due to this fact, to save time, he decides to give the game to Joseph. Now if you think that game was an absolute cluster to watch, you should have been there to play it because it was an interesting one for sure, and I want to just do a quick little post-game recap to talk about some of my favorite parts of this game, but before we get into that, we hope you did enjoy this, this fan favorites episode. We wanted to not only have the finale to replay some of the season's commanders, but also have the favorites match so people can really have a say in which commanders they see again, because we probably won't be bringing these commanders back for at least two more seasons. So if you do like this format, let us know and we will continue this for future seasons. We're planning to, but we want to make sure you guys are on board first. That being said, let's talk about this game a little bit. I'm going to give kind of my perspective as the Ruik Thar player, so keep that in mind as I go through this. But going into the game, I was a little bit worried because all three of these decks can win through my primary stacks piece or my most reliable stacks piece which is my commander. So I was a little bit happy with a faster start. As you can see, turn one was very strong, but after that, I definitely fizzled out until I drew that possibility storm. Now you may be wondering why I cast the possibility storm when I did. You know, it looked like, like Jordan was kind of popping off the turn after I played this, and it was a very intentional decision. Now the deck Jordan was playing is actually my personal deck. That's the deck that I've built since the, the commander was spoiled and I'm very familiar with that deck and I knew he was going to get insane value off of the possibility storm. However, I also knew that it would be incredibly difficult for him to win. I knew he wouldn't be able to use Shrieking Drake to draw his library and his only out was getting a Reclamation Sage off of the flips in order to kill the possibility storm or like a mirror entity to just get passive value and use all of his lands to just overrun the board. That was also a possibility. So there were two real creatures that I was concerned with and luckily he hit neither of them. Now I will admit I was not prepared for how many creatures he was able to draw and cast reliably. I was kind of counting on a lower amount of creatures, but even with the amount he cast and with the creature density in that deck, it's not even unlucky for him to hit neither of those. I would say at this point, I haven't done the numbers, but I think it's about a 50-50% chance to hit neither of those. So my plan was to use the possibility storm to completely shut down Nate and hopefully just kind of make Jordan a threat and then have him fizzle while I kind of just behind the scenes build up a board state. Uh, I figured Jordan would be in a position to where he was going to be very volatile after the big pop-off turn because I knew that turn was coming and you know thankfully he wasn't able to get mana breach so he was a little short on lands or at least had to go mana negative as he was casting these creatures and uh, overall, he did get a lot of value off of the untap abilities, but it wasn't enough to get him there. So it was very intentional playing the possibility storm into the creature untap draw value fest that is the deck Jordan was playing. However, it was intentional and it in the end paid off. That being said, for the most valuable card, obviously I have to give it to the possibility storm. That card mixed with Rurikthar's ability is insane. I'll be honest. I'll be I'll be super honest with you guys. Where. Uh, 30 minutes into this video, I think this is the part where I could be honest with you guys. I slept on Possibility Storm. I I did not think that card was worth slotting in, and I almost pulled it out for the test games we played with this and for the games that we played on camera previously. I just didn't think it had enough value. I thought the, the situational and the chaos part of it was just not good enough to keep it in the deck. However, with Ruik Thar out on the battlefield, having both of them there really just shuts off every non-creature deck and really just ruins the plans of even creature-based decks. 
It makes it very hard to get rid of either of those permanents, either Rickthar or Possibility Storm, without taking a massive amount of damage, and it makes things really unreliable while I just sit back and just try to swing and get my passive value. So I did sleep on it because, you know, I knew it was strong, and I knew it was strong with Rurik Thar. I didn't ignore that part of it, but it is an expensive piece of stacks interaction, and, it, and it's hard to cast reliably. But if you can get both of those on the field, again, it's hard because you have 5 CMC permanent and a 6 CMC permanent, but they're both very strong together. So I slept on that card, but I'm glad I never cut it because that card actually puts in, puts in work. So that being said, that is the most valuable card for this game. Also being said, that is all we have for this video. I apologize if my post-game recap was a little biased, but this game was crazy and exciting and fun, and I just wanted to give my kind of spin on it from my point of view, at least briefly. That all being said, that is all we have for this video and for Season 1. This is the last Season 1 episode or video on Season 1 that you will see, so... Let us know if you enjoyed Season 1, let us know if you like the seasonal structure, and let us know if you're excited for Season 2. Episode 1 of Season 2 is dropping in just a few days, and the commander choices for this one much more varied. We're taking a step back from some of the topper of tier commanders, and we're experimenting with some more of those, let's call them high-powered commanders, building them up to be strong commanders, but having a little bit more variation with the commander choice, so we hope you'll enjoy that in this upcoming season. That being said, again, this is all we have for this video. I am Joseph, this is Casually Competitive MTG, and we will see you next time.